Well, it's good to see everyone here this evening. Watch this. Isn't that cool? <clears throat> Took me all day to do that. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you. And uh, our study this evening is in the book of Revelation, chapter 8. So if you have your New Testament, we invite you to study along with us. Uh, we looked last time at chapter 7, we noticed that there was an interlude. Remember that the uh, Lamb began to open the six seals of the book that we were shown in chapter 5. In chapter 6, the first six of those seals were opened, and then there was an interlude or a pause in chapter 7. We suggested that uh, the two groups of people that we saw, the 144,000 and then the great multitude, are actually the same people that it is a before and after picture of God's people. They are protected from tribulation, and then they are victorious over their persecutors. And the chapter ended with this great scene again before the throne as it anticipates the final outcome and the final victory. And so rather than make us wait until the end, John says, I want you to see what's going to happen to the faithful. I want you to know that God's going to take care of them all the way through this, that he has marked them as belonging to him. They cannot be hurt by what the world will do to them. And after they have come out of this great ordeal, they get to be with their Lord forever. They are given the white robes, and they praise God around his throne. No more hungering, thirsting, or any discomfort. Uh, they are there in the presence of God, and God takes care of them. And so it is, again, this wonderful message, not only of triumph, but of God's concern and care that is so central to the book that we saw in chapter 7. Uh, with that uh, kind of putting their minds at ease, then, we come back to chapter 8, and the seventh seal opens, and we'll be looking this evening at uh, what happens as we uh, see the opening of that final seal from the book. So in chapter 8 and verse 1, when the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And this again is dramatic. Uh, it is making us kind of wait before the big bang comes at the end. Uh, if you've read chapter 8, you know, though, that it's not one big bang, that this seal introduces us to another series of seven. And uh, there's a lot of that in the book, this telescoping kind of unfolding where one thing uh, ends and then it picks up another series of things. And it'll be that way until we get to uh, chapter 11 or so uh, when we see the grand finale of this part of the book. But it's more than just a dramatic pause uh, because interestingly enough, there is kind of a history in the Bible of silence. And silence is very often associated with divine judgment. Silence reminds us of the silence of the tomb. Dead people are silent. And people who are alone, whose help has been cut off, who find that they have no place to turn, those people are usually silent. You think about Job when he was afflicted. We are told that his friends came to see him and they sat silent on the ground for many days before they could speak to him. And so silence in the Bible is associated not only with God destroying people, but also uh, misery that comes upon them as well. Uh, look at a couple passages, if you will, uh, that make this point in Psalm 31, 17. Let me not be put to shame, O Lord, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be silent in Sheol. So the silence of the grave uh, is there. Isaiah 47 in verse 5, sit silently and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you will no longer be called the queen of kingdoms. And so going into the darkness, into the gloom, this gloomy picture of uh, destruction and judgment is equated with silence there. And not only uh, the Babylonians in Isaiah, but in Ezekiel, uh, the city of Tyre, and there's a lot of imagery from the destruction of Tyre in the book of Revelation. But here we see, moreover, in their wailing, they will take up a lamentation for you and lament over you. Who is like Tyre, like her who is silent in the midst of the sea? Of course, Tyre was an island in the ancient world. And uh, the picture here is that she is now 
uh, like an island in every way, isolated, cut off, no help, desolate, and alone. And so when we hear that there is silence here in Revelation chapter 8, it's not just a lack of activity. There is this um, ominence of uh, coming dread and danger. Uh, Amos 8, the end is come for my people Israel, I will spare them no longer. The songs of the palace will turn to wailing in that day, declares the Lord God. Many will be the corpses in every place they will cast them forth in silence. And so there we see silence uh, equated with death and a scene of terrible destruction. Uh, 1 Samuel 2 and verse 9, He keeps the feet of his godly ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. Uh, perhaps even more to the point is Zephaniah. Uh, if you're familiar with the book of Zephaniah, Zephaniah's theme is judgment, the judgment of God. And here in chapter 1, it kind of unleashes in a great fury, and we hear the Lord saying, Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. If you've read the Old Testament very much, you know that the day of the Lord is not just the day that the Lord shows up. It's the day that he shows up to destroy somebody. The day of the Lord is always a day of judgment. So the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice Somebody's going to die, in other words. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the people of Canaan will be silenced. All who weigh out silver will be cut off. Uh, we're going to see later on in the book that that is one of the characteristics of the enemy of God's people in the book of Revelation. She's going to later be described as a great whore or prostitute that has made herself rich by selling herself to the nations. And so this idea of those who have been materialistic and greedy and fleshly, they are going to have to pay for their sins and they will be silenced. Uh, we get that in Zephaniah. Uh, there's perhaps also another aspect to this. We're perhaps familiar with the scene in Habakkuk chapter 2. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. And remember that Habakkuk is about the coming destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And so before God unleashes his fury, there is this call for silence. It is a very serious and somber moment, and it demands silence. Zechariah 2.12, Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. And that imagery occurs elsewhere in the Old Testament whenever God is aroused it means that he is coming forth to destroy somebody. And so there seems to be that sense here, that it's not just silence, but there is a great destruction that is about to happen. This silence is uh, foreboding. This silence anticipates God bringing the enemy down to death. Uh, it has also been suggested that there is another element to this silence, uh, some scholars have suggested that we might have here kind of a primeval silence, just like there would have been silence before God created the world and populated it with living things while the earth was dead and, and pretty much, uh, you know, uninhabitable. There was silence. And some have suggested that that might be an idea here as well, that God is going to take this enemy and annihilate them as if they didn't exist and before he creates a new world. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the Jewish rabbis believed, not that the Bible said so, but they believed that there was silence when God drowned the Egyptians at the Red Sea. And the reason uh, that is significant is not only because of the similarities between the creation story and the Exodus story, uh, but as we are going to see here in chapter 8, that many of these uh, trumpets that sound that bring destruction are modeled after the plagues of Egypt. And so if we hear here kind of a Jewish sense of coming destruction like at the Exodus, well, that might not be unintentional. And so this first seal is broken and there is this ominous silence uh, and we therefore wait before 
we hear what's going on. We're told in verse uh, 2, I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Uh, the question has been raised just exactly, therefore, what is this seventh seal? Some have suggested that the seventh seal is the silence, that the enemy is gone, they've been destroyed, there is none to, to fight against the Lord now, they're all dead and gone, and that's silent. Uh, I would suggest that's probably not the idea, uh, because this series of seals has been a partial judgment. Remember we noted back in chapter 6 that God said, do not destroy everything, but only a third of this and a third of that, uh, a fourth of the earth, uh, and so forth. God is trying to get these people to repent. And we noted some Old Testament passages where God sends difficulties upon people to try to get their attention and try to get them to repent. So I don't think this is the final destruction and this is the silence of their death. Uh, I think a better suggestion is that the seventh seal is the seven trumpets, that this last judgment is itself a series of judgments, or perhaps some might even say, well, there's a simpler way to say it, that this just introduces us to God's judgment upon this people. Uh, however you want to say it, though, I think that's the idea here, that this last seal introduces us to God's wrath against these people. And so we saw there in verse 2 that there are seven angels. And notice that they are the seven angels. Not just any old seven angels, but the seven angels. Uh, the Jews believed that there were seven archangels who were given authority over the nations. Now, the Bible nowhere says that, but in some of the literature that the Jews wrote in the intertestamental period, they talk about this a lot. They actually have names for all seven of them. Uh, there is a hint of this in the book of Daniel. I believe it's Daniel chapter 12, where it talks about Michael going to war on behalf of the saints. And the idea there is that there is an angel who is appointed to take care of God's people. Well, the Jews believe that angels ruled the world, that God gave the job of of uh, managing the nations to angels. Uh, you might remember the book of Hebrews and that point about chapter 1, how Jesus is greater than the angels. Well, the reason the author had to make that point, you'll recall, is because the Jews believed that angels were pretty important characters. And here's what we see exactly in Revelation 8 and verse 2, that there are agents of God's destruction uh, that he uses that are described as angels. Uh, in Exodus 12, 23, the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. This is the 10th plague on Egypt. He will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. And so there is some agent of God that is simply called the destroyer uh, that God used to unleash his wrath on the Egyptians. Psalm 78, 49, he sent upon them his burning anger, fury, and indignation and trouble, a band of destroying angels. Now, I realize that there's probably a, a high degree of figurative language there that his anger and his fury are like forces that God sends out, but it's interesting that they are identified with angels. And the idea seems to be that God uses these supernatural beings to unleash his wrath against his enemies. And so we have these agents of destruction, and I think uh, people familiar with the Old Testament would have got that pretty quickly, and seven trumpets were given to them. So let's talk about why they have trumpets. Uh, everybody in the ancient world knew that trumpets were basically used for one thing, and that is to signal that war was about to begin. And so that these angels, these uh, agents of destruction are given trumpets is not surprising, and it gives us a clue as to what they are about. Uh, one thing that trumpets did in association with war is to assemble people for war or to call an attack. Uh, you may recall in the fall of Jericho uh, that, they, uh, that there were seven trumpets mentioned, seven priests blowing seven trumpets, and then in Joshua 6 and verse 10, 
Joshua says, before they blow, be silent. So there is silence followed by trumpets at the fall of Jericho. Remember what Jericho is. It is the first great enemy that God's people face as they come into the land of Canaan. Uh, in Judges chapter 7, Gideon used trumpets to defeat the Midianites. Remember, he had a much smaller group of people, but he surrounded them and blew the trumpets on occasions to make the enemy think they were surrounded by a much larger force. And of course, the trumpet sound made them think that they were being attacked. Uh, Jeremiah 51, as uh, God here speaks about his judgment against uh, his people, lift up a signal in the land and blow a trumpet among the nations. In other words, God is going to assemble the nations for war against his people. Consecrate the nations against her. Summon against her the kingdoms of Ararat, Mini, and Ashkenaz. Bring up the horses like bristly locusts. We're going to see those locusts uh, later on in the book, so I want you to see that reference there, but keep that in mind. Uh, but not only could trumpets call people to assemble for war, but also trumpets were used in the ancient world to sound an alarm. We still do this in our society today. Uh, not so much, I think, down in Florida anymore, but when I lived uh, in the Midwest, when a storm was coming, we had these civil air sirens that would go off. And you could hear them for miles around. It meant that a really bad storm was coming, and you better get ready. Well, in the ancient world, trumpets meant uh, not only that your army was supposed to attack, but a trumpet could also mean that you were getting attacked, that there was danger. Jeremiah 4, declare in Judah, proclaim in Jerusalem, and say, blow the trumpet in the land. Cry aloud and say, assemble yourselves. Let us go into the fortified cities. They're not assembling for war. They're assembling to hide from the enemy. Lift up a standard toward Zion. Seek refuge. Do not stand still, for I am bringing evil from the north and great destruction. So blow the trumpet and sound the warning for everybody to run and hide. Jeremiah 42, 14. The people say, no, we will go to the land of Egypt where we will not see war or hear the sound of a trumpet. No more danger, in other words, in Egypt. We'll go where things are kind of calm and we won't hear these warning sounds all the time and we'll be fine there. Uh, perhaps even more to the point here in the book of Revelation is Joel chapter 2. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, surely it is near, a day of darkness, gloom, clouds, and thick darkness, uh, and uh, so forth. We have this great destruction coming that Joel talked about. And notice that the trumpet here announces the day of the Lord, the time when God comes to judge. And of course, that picture in Zephaniah, we hear this as well, Zephaniah 1, near is the great day of the Lord, near and coming very quickly. And so at the end of that passage, uh, we see it as a, a day of wrath is that day, trouble and distress, destruction, desolation, darkness, gloom, clouds, darkness, a day of trumpet, a day in which all the alarms are going to be going off and people will be running and hiding against the fortified cities and the high corner towers. So you see, trumpets uh, are a very uh, alarming thing in the ancient world, and that certainly is the point here as well. Uh, there are some other allusions here to Jericho that are interesting. Um, in Jericho, we had six days of trumpeting plus one day of lots of trumpeting, and so here we're going to have seven trumpets, six plus one. Uh, and we mentioned a moment ago, but we ought to perhaps make it clear that Jericho is not only the first city that Israel fights in the land. They are, in many senses, the city that Israel fights in the land. They are a type of every city that they must fight. They are a type of how every battle must be fought by faith in the Lord. Jericho is an evil city, just like every other evil city that they're going to come to. And, of course, here we have in the book of Revelation the great evil city of Rome, another city that is going to be judged by God. Uh, interestingly enough, in Jer uh, Revelation 11, 
and in verse 13. At the end of this great uh, climax of events, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. The rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. There's an echo there of the destruction of Jericho. And so this idea of trumpeting and warfare and alarm and danger, all of that comes uh, here into this scene. But there is another thing that is associated with trumpets, uh, and this is a good thing. In Exodus chapter 19, you recall that after God led Israel through the wilderness, that he finally brought them to Mount Sinai. And before God gave them the Ten Commandments, uh, God said that no hand shall touch him, he shall be stoned, uh, that is, if anybody touches the mountain. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. And so we have here a great assembly. God is calling his people unto himself. He's already killed the Egyptians. They're all dead. They are silent. And now God calls the trumpet sound for his people to come to him. And we're going to see that same kind of thing uh, in Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 and following, that when the seventh angel sounds his trumpet, we're going to be back in heaven again. This is the trumpet call for God's people to come to him. And so there's kind of a mixture of things going on here. Uh, it is the prelude to judgment. It is the warning that destruction is going to happen. But in that same thing, it is good news for the people of God, for they will be uh, brought to their God. So in verse 3, another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer and much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. And so here in verses 3 and 4, we get altar imagery. You can never tell which way the imagery is going to go in the book of Revelation. Uh, we hear about angels with trumpets. The next thing we expect is hear a trumpet, but you don't. We see another angel doing something at an altar. Um, of course, in the Old Testament, uh, the smoke of the altar of incense was a figure of the prayers of the people. And the smoke from a sacrifice, we are often told in the Old Testament, in Exodus and over and over again in Leviticus, was something that was pleasing to God. Uh, also, I put up there Joshua 6.24, and I haven't found anybody that will agree with me on this yet, but uh, I've always had the suspicion that uh, the destruction of Jericho is treated kind of like a sacrifice in the Old Testament, that it is burned with fire, and even though the Bible doesn't talk about its smoke going up, uh, you remember that it is completely destroyed like a burnt offering would be, and the implication might be that it, like a sacrifice, goes up, and the, the death of that city is pleasing to God. Uh, if that is involved here, you can see that uh, this much incense that is given to this angel might be another way of talking about the coming destruction, the death and the smoke from that death coming up uh, before God. Uh, now, you may recall, however, that there are actually two altars in the tabernacle and in the temple. Uh, one is the altar of incense, the other is the altar of sacrifice. The altar of sacrifice is outside, the altar of incense is inside. Well, in the book of Revelation and in apocalyptic texts in general, uh, there is no distinction between the two. It's as, as if the two become one. And so, if we were to ask, well, is this the uh, altar of incense or is it the altar of sacrifice? It's both. It has the qualities of both. Uh, what we have here, of course, is that there has been the sacrifice of human lives. The, all, the uh, martyrs have offered their lives, and we saw them before. Remember back in chapter, uh, chapter 6, in verse... Nine, the fifth seal I saw underneath the altar, the souls of those who had been slain, 
And they cried out with a loud voice saying, uh, How long, O Lord, will you refrain from judging and avenging? Well, here we see that altar again. Uh, the sacrifice has been made. They are crying out to God. So the smoke of their death, as it were, and the smoke of their prayers is both going up to God. And interestingly enough, uh, even in the Old Testament, uh, the distinction between the altar of sacrifice and the altar of incense is not always, you know, just always distinguished. Uh, in the ceremony concerning the Day of Atonement, in Leviticus 16, the priest had to go back and forth between the two uh, on a couple of occasions. He had to offer the lamb, then go in and sprinkle it on the altar and burn incense, then come back out and, and so forth. And so the two altars are connected. And in Psalm 141 in verse 2, may my prayer be counted as incense before you, may the lifting up of my hands be counted as the evening offering. And so here, these, both of these altars have a sense of giving ourselves uh, to God and of something being consumed. Um, more to the point, perhaps, is Ezekiel 10. I looked, and behold, in the expanse that was over the heads of the cherubim, something like a sapphire stone in appearance resembling a throne appeared above them. We might say, I know what that is, right? That's probably an image of God on his throne. He spoke to the man clothed in linen and said, Enter between the whirling wheels under the cherubim, fill your hands with coals of fire from beneath the cherubim, and scatter them over the city. And so he's going to set the city on fire, throw this destruction over the city. Uh, Genesis 19 we're told that the Lord, Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire out of heaven. This idea that, you know, there is this heavenly fire coming to destroy a wicked place uh, seems to be the idea here as well. Uh, but it is also uh, a fire not only of destruction, but a fire of God's people praying for the destruction of their enemies. So all of these images kind of come together. Uh, much incense was given, and uh, it was uh, the smoke with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. We're told then in verse 4 that the uh, angel took the censer, filled it with the fire of the altar, threw it to the earth, and there followed peals of thunder, sounds and flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Four things that happen when this divine wrath is kindled, as it were, and uh, we, we get lists like this in the Old Testament whenever God unleashes his destruction against a nation. Uh, in Exodus 19, in verse 16, when Israel comes up to Mount Sinai, the list is not exactly the four th same things there, but we have a list of four things that there is fire and earthquake and smoke uh, making the sight of God awesome. In Isaiah 29, from the Lord of hosts. Remember, Lord of hosts is God's name when he's about to destroy somebody. Uh, the Lord of hosts, from him you will be punished with thunder and earthquake and loud noise and whirlwind and tempest and the flame of a consuming fire. And then in Psalm 18, we won't take the time to read that entire passage, but in verses 7 through 13, uh, we have there the prayer of the righteous man to, to uh, God to rescue him from the wicked and to send all of these kinds of things, send fire and uh, torment and, and earthquake and all these things upon the wicked. So it is typical language for God about to destroy somebody. Uh, with that in mind, then, let's look at what happened. Starting in verse 6, the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. The first sounded, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Just reading that first trumpet, hail and fire, what's the first thing you think of? What is it? Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. What's the second thing you think of? One of the plagues in Egypt had that, right? Hail mixed with fire. Uh, there's going to be a lot of that here 
uh, in this uh, trumpet. Uh, remember, the plagues on Egypt were designed to harden Pharaoh's heart so that God would show his power through this stubborn man. Uh, we are told in Exodus 12 and verse 12, remember, that God says that against the Egyptians and their gods, I will execute my judgments. And that's a very important thing to remember, that the plagues were not just against the Egyptians. It was against the gods of the Egyptians, the gods that they depended on to protect them from harm. And remember the context here. We have a man, the Roman emperor, who is being worshipped like a god. And he is being called the savior of the world. And he is being called divine and the son of God. And all of those titles that are given only to God in the Bible. And so God here is going to judge another wicked nation with a false god. A god that people have trusted in just so happens to be that he is the emperor of Rome. And we all remember what happened when the plagues were unleashed, that there was a great climax, and finally the, uh, the enemy was defeated at the Red Sea. I want you to keep that in mind, because the sea is going to come back to us in the book of Revelation as well. But we have here fire. Fire is often the biblical way of talking about lightning. There is no distinct word uh, in the Old Testament for lightning. Lightning was called fire from heaven or fire from the sky. And so we have here hail and fire thrown down to the earth. Uh, that is lightning. But this is also mixed with blood. And remember the first plague on Egypt was the Nile turning to blood. God's way of saying, this is what I'm going to do to you if you don't repent and let my people go. There'll be blood everywhere. And there's a lot more blood coming in the book of Revelation before we're done, uh, but this is the first hint of a lot of it. Uh, and so with this great unleashing of uh, these phenomenon, we are told that a third of the earth is burned up, a third of the trees and all the grass indicating the idea or the imagery of famine. And of course, keep in mind the bigger picture here, that God is going to deliver his people. And if somebody begins to tell you a story and it sounds a lot like the ten plagues, you should say, hey, I know how this story ends, that the good people uh, of God are rescued and the wicked people are judged in the end. Well, that's exactly where this story is going as well. Uh, verse 8, a second angel sounded. And something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. A third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. A third of the ships were destroyed. In Old Testament imagery, mountains are symbols of kingdoms. Mountains are great, big, majestic, strong things. And to the extent that they are those things, they are symbols of kingdoms that are big and strong and majestic. Um, in Revelation 18.21, we have a millstone thrown into the sea. And the, uh, the angel says, so will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence. And so here it seems that this mountain is the great wicked empire of Rome, and it's going to be cast down. And in Jeremiah 51, 25, Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain. The Babylonian empire, the Babylonian kingdom, is called a destroying mountain. And God says, You're a mountain that destroys the whole earth, and I will stretch out my hand and roll you down from the crags and make you a burnt-out mountain. The idea, I'm going to throw you into the sea and your rocks will go tumbling down, that idea of destruction. And so that's the picture here as well. Uh, you'll notice that uh, this particular trumpet has to do with the sea. Uh, it is thrown into the sea, the creatures in the sea die, the ships are destroyed, 
And so it seems to affect maritime commerce. And remember, Rome is a great commercial power in the first century, that it does business with all the nations on the Mediterranean through its ships. And we're going to see later on in the, in the book of Revelation this picture again of the, uh, the ships at sea and the sea merchants wailing because of the destruction of this great empire. And of course, uh, it shouldn't surprise us that this sea appears here because the sea is representative of danger and death. And uh, we already mentioned the sea being turned to blood as Egypt's first plague. And so you have that sense of death here as well in this second trumpet. Um, the third angel sounded, verse 10, and a great star fell from heaven burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of waters. The name of the star is called Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. The idea of a star falling out of the sky is a, a prominent feature in at least two Old Testament texts, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Isaiah 14 is about the, uh, the humbling of the king of Babylon. Ezekiel 28, about God's judgment on the king of Tyre. Just kind of a footnote, um, you will often hear that those passages are about the origin of Satan. Uh, you ask somebody, you know, where'd Satan come from? They'll usually take you to these two texts, Lucifer and all that stuff. It says quite plainly in Isaiah 14, take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. And it says quite plainly in Ezekiel 28 that this is the judgment of the king of Tyre. So it's not about Satan, it's about these kings of these great nations. And stars are symbolic of things that are high and exalted, proud and arrogant, lofty, and God cuts them down. He brings them down. And that's the very thing that is uh, discussed about them in Isaiah and Ezekiel, like a great tree that is cut down or a star falling out of the sky that God has humbled the proud and made nothing out of them. What we have here is the very same picture, I think, that we saw in the previous trumpet. The mountain and the star, they are the same thing. Uh, you can describe the Roman Empire like a great mountain, or you can describe it like a high, arrogant, boastful, and proud thing that God is going to bring down. Each image con uh, conveys something just a little bit different, but it is, uh, again, the idea of destruction. But there is something specific about it. You'll notice that this star is called Wormwood. And in the Old Testament, Wormwood is the destruction that God gives to people who are involved in idolatry. Remember, we're talking here about the Roman Empire and emperor worship, a man being called God, people worshiping the image of the emperor as a god. Jeremiah 9, 13 the Lord said, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have walked after the Baals, behold, I will feed them with wormwood and give them poisoned water to drink, and I will send the sword until I've annihilated them. Jeremiah 8, um, I will snatch them away. There will be no grapes on the vine, no figs on the fig tree. The leaf will wither. There's that famine imagery that we see here in Revelation 8. Trees dried up, grass dried up. God says, I'm going to take their food supply away from them, as it were. And the question comes, why are we sitting still, still? Assemble yourselves. Let's go into the fortified cities and perish there because the Lord our God has doomed us and given us poisoned water to drink, for we have sinned. And at the end of that text, God says, why have they provoked me with their graven images and foreign idols? Uh, Deuteronomy 29, as God was warning the Israelites about how they better not follow idols, he says concerning the Canaanites, you've seen their abominations and their idols of wood, stone, silver, and gold, so that there will not be among you a man or woman or family whose heart turns away today from the Lord to go and serve the gods of those nations. 
and that there will not be among you a root bearing poisonous fruit and wormwood. In other words, God says, I don't want that to happen to you. And so this is a great picture of idolatry here uh, in this third trumpet. Uh, any questions down through verse 11? We're just about out of time, and I don't think we have enough time to finish exactly the fourth trumpet. Something about quitting here. Any questions or observations? All right, then. Uh, we'll pick up with the uh, fourth trumpet next week, and thank you again for your good attention, as always.